Hi folks, this is Jay. Hope you're okay today. Um, we're going to look at uh, the second part to the Christian Life Part 2. And um, as we look at this part, there'll be some things that I'll be going over again, repeating myself, but I'll repeat, be repeating in it in a new way. Um, so I'll be doing that, but also there'll be uh, some new stuff uh, in this part as well. So let's come before the Lord. Then I'm going to make a couple of his, uh, videos on history, uh, on Justin Martyr and one or two historical figures. Then I'm calling it a day. I've, I've been researching a book which I've been enjoying uh, on the Gospels, uh, and uh, I want to get on with that. So, Lord, we thank you for this day. I uh, just give you the prayers and the glory and the honor. And I just pray that you would bless this Bible study to all our hearts and may we know your love and may we know your grace may we know your care today in Jesus name Amen okay first of all um, in the Christian life we need to humble ourselves before God our Father so let's turn to uh, Ephesians chapter 3 Ephesians chapter 3, verse 14 and 15, Ephesians 3, excuse me, 14 and 15. For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and on earth is named. So Paul bows the knee before the Father, before Christ. He, he humbles himself before God. And we got to have a humble attitude. We've got to walk in humility. If we at any moment become proud, then God hates pride and God will deal with our pride. I always think of Nebuchadnezzar, how he would boast, boasted before God and God dealt with him. So let's try and walk and ask God to help us to walk in humility. Secondly, we need to go for spiritual, the spiritual life rather than a rat race. If you turn to Ephesians 3.16, it says that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by the Spirit in the inner man. That he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. That's awesome. God wants you to be strengthened in the spirit in the inner man. But notice that he would grant you according to his riches. There are riches of God. Spiritual riches. And he says the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. He wants you to be strengthened in the spirit today, in the inner man. But so often we can get entangled in the rat race. So often we can get entangled in things that are not of God. Like I've got entangled with over the last five years with these atheists on the internet. That was not of God. I got entangled with something that was not of God. I should have got entangled with this, that he would grant you according to the riches of his grace. I should have got entangled in the riches of God's grace to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. That's what I should have got involved in more and that's what I want you to get involved in, to be humble and to go for the grace of God. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 verse 18 Therefore we do not lose heart, though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day day there is a spiritual renewal within the Christian life where God is renewing our inner man by the Holy Spirit and God wants us to live in that Galatians 5 16 so I say live by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature allow the Holy Spirit to take control of your life allow the Holy Spirit to work in your life Go for the spiritual life rather than the rat race. 
in John chapter 3 the Lord says to Nicodemus you must be born again that means born of the Spirit let's turn to Romans 8 chapter 8 Romans chapter 8 Romans chapter 8 verse 5 and 9 for they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh but they that are after the spirit the things of the spirit for to be carnally minded is death but to be spiritually minded is life and peace because the carnal mind is at enmity against God for it is not subject to the law of God neither indeed can it be so then they that are in the flesh cannot please God but you are not in the flesh but in the spirit if so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is not of his. So walk in the Spirit. Walk in the Spirit of God, not in the carnal mind. Next, we need to live a life of love. I've said this before, I've repeated this, but I want to repeat it in a different way. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 14 to 21, but it says, I pray that you be rooted and established in love. God wants to be a, us wants us to be a people of love. We looked before about the, the that we should be a people of love in meditating and thinking about the love of God that He has for us. But then we have to emanate that love out to others. In John thirteen thirty four, a new commandment I give you: love one another as I have loved you. So you must love one another. John thirteen thirty four. 1 John chapter 4 verse 9 and 11 our sins dear friends this is how God showed his love among us he sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him this is love not that we loved God but that he loved us and sent his son an atoning sacrifice for our sins dear sins dear friends since God loved us we also ought to love one another 1 John chapter 4 verse 9 and 11 because the love of God has been shown to us then we have to show that love to others we also need to see that the love of God has for us as well not only live that love for others but also to see that love for us to give out uh, to receive God's love as well I've mentioned this before I'll mention it again my may have power Paul says together with all the saints to get to grasp how wide how long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know his love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God Ephesians 3 14 to 19 that you may be filled to measure with, with the fullness of God God has immense love for you when I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died my richest gain I count but lost and poor contempt and all my pride as we survey the cross we see how much God showed he loved you Robert Anderson sir Robert Anderson writes the cross was the manifestation of the divine love without reserve or limit but was also the expression of man's unutterable malignity Dean Harvey the cross is one time visual representation of God's grief over sin. Sir John Hutchins, Jesus went to the cross because God is a holy and sin must be punished. C.H. Spurgeon says, The marvel of heaven and earth of time and eternity is the etern atoning death of Jesus Christ. This is the mystery that brings more glory to God than all creation. And so when Christ died on the cross, it was the glory of God, the love of God that was shed abroad for you as Christ was punished for your sin. C.H. Spurgeon says, the marvel of heaven and earth, of time and eternity, sorry, Matthew 27, verse 35, and they crucified him and parted his garments, casting lots that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophets. They parted my garments among them, and upon my vesture did they cast lots. Christ allowed himself to die on that cross as an expression of the love of God for you. 
given his life for you. Roy Hessian, a preacher, said the devil has convinced so many people that they are worthless. Each of us needs to stop and remember the cross. At the cross we will discover our true value for it is here that we discover the price God was willing to pay for us, the depth of his love and how much we are worth to him. You know, imagine a, a five-year-old kid and she's she's got a little red dress on and little red shoes, kind of like little red riding hood. She's got blonde hair. And she get she she leaves the hand of her mother and she goes into this labyrinth in the garden. It's a big labyrinth, and it 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 she gets lost and she's walking in that labyrinth. And there are ditches, there are foxes, there are traps there. There's all sorts of things that she goes walking through and she's lost and she's crying out for a moment and do you think her mom's just going to stand at the end of the labyrinth and just not have any emotion? Do you think her mom's just going to stand there? If she's any kind of a mother she will be yearning for her little daughter and she she will go through that labyrinth and she will pursue her daughter Till she gets hold of her daughter and her daughter will be crying and she'll get hold of her daughter and she'll hold her daughter in her hands. My daughter, I love you. Come here. You were lost. That is what God wants with you. You have gone in your labyrinth of life and you've done things, said things, lived things. And those things that you've said and those things that you've done, no one will know only you. Only God and you know. And you know the labyrinth that you went through. You know the agony and the pain and the suffering. You know the sins that you enjoyed, that you reveled in more than anybody else would know. You reveled in those sins and enjoyed to the full things that were disgusting and perverted. You enjoyed them. And you went in the labyrinth of life. Sometimes you were in agony. Sometimes you were in tears. Sometimes you were furious and angry. And you went on that journey. And all that time, just as that little girl is in a labyrinth and the mother pursues that little girl, her daughter, and desires to grab her daughter and put her in a arms so God has been doing that with you he's been doing it with you he's been pursuing you in the labyrinth of life he's been pursuing you in the labyrinth of life and he so much wants you to come and realize what he did for you that he died on that cross and he, he gave his life for you so that your sin may be forgiven and that you may be cleaned and 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 unwashed and, and and the pain and the hurt and the, the worry and the concern and the and and the failure and, and all these things he he wants to wash them clean and give you peace. That's what he wants for you. And sometimes he he has to allow you to go down that labyrinth because you wouldn't listen. Just like the little girl, the mum tells the little girl, whatever you do, don't go down that labyrinth, my dear, because it's quite dangerous. There's potholes and there's manhunts and there's foxes and also Don't go down that manhunt. And the little girl says, I'm going, and she goes. And God says, don't go that way. And when we go that way, we there's, a, there's our conscience that tells us, no, we shouldn't go. But sometimes we go down that rabbit trail, and we go down that rabbit trail, we go down that labyrinth because we're hurting inside. We're all screwed up and mixed up, and God knows that. God knows that. He knows that. He knows that. He knows that. He knows you're mixed up. He knows you're messed up. He knows you're screwed up. He knows people screwed you up. He knows that. Maybe some of you have been abused by your family, by your parents. Maybe some of you have been abused by your spouse. Maybe some of you 
have gone through, uh, have experienced abuse in some way in your life, and that has screwed you up. And then you've gone down on your labyrinth of life trying to work out all the screwed up things that happened to you. And God knows that. God knows that. God isn't going to condemn you for it. God isn't going to put you down for it. God isn't going to smash your brains for it. When he knows that you've been in pain, he knows that you've been suffering, he knows that you've been screwed up, he knows that you've been trying to work it all out. You see, God. You see, God. is a God of grace. And he's a God of restoration. And that's what he wants for you. He wants to bring restoration and grace for you. And he's got more blessings than you could ever dream. You say, oh, Jay, are you, are you trying to honey salt me now? Are you trying to give me some honey salt? Are you trying to give me some opium so you just deaden me? Is that what you're trying to do? Or are you offering all this blessing, are you? I'm not offering you earthly blessing. I'm not offering you earthly blessing. I'm offering you spiritual blessing. I'm offering you an experience of God that is beyond this world. I must, I'm offering you a peace that you cannot find in this world. I must, I'm offering you a God who is alive and who has pursued you and will continue to pursue you until you find your hope in him. God's love for you is great. He says, taste and see that the Lord is good. In that labyrinth, we can choose to stay in the labyrinth with all our screwed upness and get ourselves into more screwed upness. Or we can hear the voice of the mother. We can hear the voice of the mother calling. And we can hear that voice and know that voice is near. And then we can say, Mom, Mom, I'm here. And the mom can come and grab us and hold us. And the same with God. We can go in the, in the labyrinth of life and we can take our screwed upness and live in our screwed upness. But in the distance, God says, I loved you, I died for you. For God so loved the world that I gave my only begotten Son, that whoever believes on him shall not perish but have everlasting life. And that is the voice of God calling to you in the labyrinth. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes on him shall not perish but have everlasting life. And the God is calling, God is saying, God is showing you, he is speaking his love to you as you hear those words. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes on him shall not perish but have everlasting life. And the love of God, the voice of God is being said. And in your labyrinth, you can either just keep in your labyrinth with all your screwed upness, or you can hear that voice and say, He's, I hear the call of God. I hear God. I hear His love for me. I see His love for me on the cross. And you can go to Him and say, Lord, I know you died for me. I confess my sin. I am screwed up. Lord, I can't do this anymore. Forgive me. And as you say that, and as you come to him, he will forgive you, he'll wash you, he'll cleanse you, and he'll make you anew. Sometimes we have to go down the labyrinth of life. Sometimes we have to take our screwed upness to its very, very limits, and then at that point it's either we break or we bow the knee to Christ. Some of you will go to the very, very edge of your screwed upness. You will go to the very edge of it. Some of you won't come back. Some of you will take it to the point where you will not cry out and see the love of God for you. And that is a tragedy. 
and I hope that you do not do that but some of you will some of you will prefer to live in the labyrinth to hold on to your screwed upness and allow yourself to perish without the love of God and if you do that 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 is a tragedy beyond belief but some of you will hear the call you'll hear the love of God and when you hear that love of God come home just come home just come on. Say, Lord, I, 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 I believe you died for me. I don't understand it, but I believe you died for me. I'm coming on. In Luke chapter 15, It, it says, and he spoke the parable, What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he lose one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after that which is lost until he find it? He lose a sheep, the shepherd, he'll go and find it. It talks about a lady who lost a coin and she searches all over. God searching for you. It talks about the prodigal son who said, Father, give me all that I want, goes off, enjoys his life realizes what a fool he made, goes back to his father his father grabs him, puts a ring on his finger puts a wonderful cloak round him and kills the fatty calf, treats him as if he's never sinned that's the grace of God the woman caught in adultery in Rome, uh, Luke, uh, 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 John chapter 8 Jesus went out unto the Mount of Olives and early in the morning he came again into the temple and all the people came unto him and he sat down and taught them and the scribes and the Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery and when they had set her in the midst they said unto him master the woman was taken in adultery in the very act now Moses was in the law commanded us that such should be stoned but what sayest thou and they said tempting him that they might have to accuse him but Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrought on the ground as though he heard them not so when they continued asking him he lifted up himself and said unto them he that is without sin among you let him first cast a stone to at her and again he stood down and wrote on the ground and they which heard it being convinced by their own conscience went out by one beginning at the elder even unto the last, and Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst. And Jesus had lifted up himself, saw one, but none but the woman. And he said unto her, Woman, where are thou those thine accusers? Have not men condemned thee? She said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. Go and sin no more. Just as a side, those clever clogs who say, well, that passage is actually not in the book of John. This is just an aside for these clever clogs and these academic scholars in textual criticism today who will tell you that that is not in the actual original Greek. Well, just an aside, textual criticism took on um, a massive change in the 19th century and there were two schools of thought there was the Westcott and Hort school of thought and there was the Dean Bergen and the Scrivener school of thought and so there was half the scholarly world believed that the ancient text from the Byzantine side had this originally in the other half of the scholarship followed Westcott and Hort the modern scholars that you see in the academic world today have taken on board Westcott and Hort's views in other words what I'm saying to you there is a a massive vast scholarship that has been ignored in textual criticism by modern textual critics since the 19th century and there is solid evidence to prove that this is a, this text is actually part of the gospel I can give you some evidences right now number one St Augustine gives a mention of why this passage was left out in some ancient manuscripts number two if you go and look at the early church fathers quotations that is in the second century AD 
they are quoting from this passage which tells you that this passage was already in the original text okay that's just a little textual criticism lesson the point my friend is that Christ did not condemn this woman but showed her the tender love of God and that's all I want to say to you is that you need to know the tender love of God today he's not going to condemn you he's not going to judge you he's not going to put you down he wants you to know his love and peace today and he invites you to trust in him to come and believe in him by faith and as you believe in him and trust in him and confess your sins to him he will forgive you so we've looked at a few things in the Christian life there and we'll just turn to a passage and then we'll close and then I'm going to do a couple of historical biographies and then I'm going to get on with the book that I've been writing which I've been enjoyed writing if you want to know some of the research that I've been doing for the book if you look at the video Irenaeus and the four Gospels you'll see some of the work that I've been doing on the book on that video if you turn to 1 John one John chapter 1 and he says this if we confess our sins he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness and you confess your sin today he will cleanse you from all unrighteousness the grace of God the grace of God is immense the love of God is immense it's vast it's beyond your wildest dreams his love is awesome his love is immense the darkest blackest heart that is known to history can know the love of God today can know forgiveness and peace because of the staggering grace and the majesty of the love of God that was shown on that cross so however much you feel you've made a mistake however much you have failed in your walk with God or failed if you don't know God however big a sin you've done or however many sins or however screwed up you might feel you are there's always a chance of new hope new life new forgiveness new way of living there's always hope because God is a God of grace he's a God of grace he's a God of grace so there's always hope always hope it's like it's like um, it's like uh, an old man on a beach and he he makes a uh, a beautiful statue of a, of, a, of a man and he carves the statue out of stone and he puts it on the beach and everybody comes to admire it and thinks it's wonderful but some teenagers come and they paint the whole of the statue black it's all black and it's all marred it's all been marred And you look at it and you think it's a total mess. The statue's been just desecrated. But then the tide comes in.
and the great sea of the ocean comes in and begins to cover the statue and the immense ocean fall is over that statue covers it and within minutes the statue is washed clean and then the next day the tide goes out and the statue is looking even more beautiful than it even began we start in this life as babies and we grow up and we become messed up messed up by what people did to us messed up by our things that we did we become marred and we become sinful just as the ocean goes over the statue and cleans it so the ocean of the grace of God is through the cross through the blood of Christ comes and washes us and cleanses and makes us anew and that's what God wants for you taste and see that the Lord is good okay I'm going to close in prayer and I'm going to do a couple of videos on one on Justin Martyr and uh, on one another maybe on another and then another historical subject and then that's it for the day I'm going to get on with this book so Lord we thank you that your love is vast and immense your love is great and, and your love is truly amazing you are a truly an amazing God but Lord there are people out there who are hurting have been hurt by others and you are hurting and wherever they're at at this moment in time pray that they would come home to you and I pray that you would breathe into them your love and grace and so Lord I pray bless them show them your love and grace today I ask this Lord in your name and for your glory Amen Amen Amen. God bless you. I am now going to do a couple of historical videos for five minutes each. One on Justin Martyr and uh, something else. I might even just do a little bit on textual criticism. And then we're going to call it a day. Okay, so thank you for listening and take care. I will from time to time, every now and again, do some Bible studies. Uh, just a couple a week and post them around. So watch out for them if you want another Bible study let me know and uh, I can do one rather than next week I could do it in, in a few days time if you'd be interested in wanting me to do some more Bible studies but I'll be doing them anyway a couple of uh, every couple of weeks so so that's it really and uh, please pray uh, for me pray for the street preaching it's going really well uh, pray that the atheist uh, would uh, be respectful and uh, and whatever you um, yeah you 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 know what to pray about that uh, pray pray that they would know the love of God um, and yeah just look after yourself and take care all right thanks for listening and God bless you. Hi folks, uh, we're doing a, a Bible study on the Christian life and I uh, hope it's going to be a blessing to you, so let's come before the Lord. Lord Jesus Christ, we thank you for your goodness and love and Father, we come in his name and we pray for the presence of the Holy Spirit. We pray that you be with us and that you will bless us now as we look at your word in this two-part Bible study. We ask this Lord in your name and for your glory. Amen. Okay, um, we just got a an eclectic selection of scriptures on various topics. So what is the Christian life about? Well, if I was to ask you what would it be, what's it like, what, what is the, the army life like, or what is navy life like? You would have some conception of what the army life was like, or the navy life. So what is it 
when we say what is the Christian life? Well, first of all, the Christian life is a life of prayer. Um, so we read from Bernard of Clavaux, prayer is a wine which makes glad the heart of man. And so let's just turn to some scriptures in prayer. Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. Verse 5 and 12. Uh, Matthew chapter 6. Verse 5 and 12. When thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets, that they may be seen of men. Verily I say to you, they have their reward. But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet. When thou hast shut thy door, pray to the Father which is in secret, and thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. But when you pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. Be not ye therefore like unto them, for your Father knoweth what things ye have need of before you ask him. After this manner therefore pray, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us all our debts, as we forgive us our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, for ever. Amen. For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. So, the Christian life is a life of prayer. It, it, it's a prayer where a lot of the prayer that we do, is uh, in private. Um, if you can hear in the background, that's people in neighbor's yards talking, so forgive me for that. So it's a life of prayer. Uh, let's turn to Matthew chapter 26. Verse 41. Watch and pray that you enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing but the flesh is weak. So we've got to be constantly on the watch. We've got to be persistent. If we turn to Luke chapter 11. Luke chapter 11. Verse 5 to 13. It says, And he said unto them, Which of you shall a friend, and shall, which of you shall have a friend, shall so go unto him at midnight and say unto him friend lend me three loaves for a friend of mine in his journey has come to me and i have nothing to set before him and he from within shall answer and say trouble me not the door is now shut and my children are with me in bed i cannot rise and uh, and give thee i say unto you though he will not rise and give him because he is the friend yet because of his importunity he will rise and give him as many as he needeth and I say unto you, Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For every one that asketh, receiveth, and he that seeketh, findeth. And to him that knocketh, it shall be opened. If a son shall ask bread of any of you that is a father, will he give him a stone? Or if he ask a fish, will he for a fish give him a serpent? Or if he shall ask as a, an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? So, the Christian life is a life of prayer, secret prayer especially. It's a prayer life of being watchful. And it's a prayer life that is persistent, praying constantly for the Holy Spirit, okay? Secondly, the Christian life is one of testing. If you turn to 1 Peter, chapter 1. 1 Peter, chapter 1, verse 1, uh, verse 3 to 7. 
said, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a living hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time, wherein you greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if indeed be, you are in heaviness through manifold temptations. that the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perisheth though it be tried with fire might be found unto prayers and honor and glory of the appearance of Jesus Christ so here it's quite clear that Christians go through trial I find it very disturbing that a lot of Bible teachers a lot of Christians don't believe that we can go through suffering and, and trial um, it, the argument goes something like this people will say well it's religious just just religious teaching that you can go through trials you can suffer that you can have sickness even uh, the Word of God says we'll be healed the Word of God says we'll be blessed but the Word of God does say we can be healed and the Word of God does say we can be blessed but the Word of God also teaches that we can suffer and that we go through difficult times and so we've got to have the whole counsel of God and we've got to be balanced and it's not being religious to say that God uses suffering and can take us through difficult periods of sickness the point is that it's a life of testing that we will go through difficult times and in those difficult times we have to believe and trust that God will be with us so the Christian life is a life of prayer it's a life of testing and it's a life in the Word of God the Christian life is a life in the Word of God and this is so vital that we have to be in the Word of God it's so important today to be in the Word of God I I, I do a lot of street preaching and evangelism and I am so blessed because often I have to get into the Bible to go out and when I talk to people they I meet Christian, uh, Christian evangelist and I get encouraged by them when I come on the internet and I get involved with these atheists and things like that I, I don't get any blessing I don't find it a blessing because I don't find them in the Word of God and I lose my strength I, I react in the flesh and it's not good we need to be in the Word of God there's so much difficulty today and we need to be encouraged and the Bible will encourage us Psalm 119 verse 11 thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee Psalm 119 verse 5 sorry I got itchy nose oh that my ways were directed to keep thy statutes Proverbs chapter 30 verse 5 For every word of God is pure, he is a shield unto them that put their trust in him. Every word of God is pure. Colossians 3.16 What you need most of all is to be in, in the word of God. Let the word, Colossians 3.16, let the word Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms, hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your heart in the Lord. Let the scriptures fill you today. Fill your life with scripture. Make that a priority today. If anything else that you make, that you'll fill your life with scripture. And I'm telling you, you'll be blessed. Hebrews chapter 4, 12. I, I spent today a couple of hours in the Word with listening to a guy called Stuart Olliot and Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones and oh I felt so blessed and so encouraged being in the Word of God Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12 for the Word of God is quick and powerful sharper than a, a two-edged sword piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart the Word of God is sharper, more powerful than a two-edged sword. 
it's all right to do apologetics, but we need to depend on the Word of God. I do a lot of evangelism, and I talk to a lot of people. And I give arguments for the Christian faith, but arguments will not save people. It's the Word of God. It's the Holy Spirit. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23. 1 Peter 1. 23. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God which liveth and abideth forever. The word of God lives and abides forever. It's incorruptible, and it's what you can build your life on in these days. And I would encourage you to do that. Then, it's a life of love. Life of prayer, a life of trial, a life of in the word and then it's a life of love so let's turn to John 3.16 for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life for God so loved the world God's a God of love. He loved the world, and we should love the world and care for people. If he was willing to give all that he had for us, we should be willing to care for others too. Romans 5, 8. But God commendeth his love towards that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Christ died for us when we were sinners. Romans 8, 28. So it's, to, it's also a, a life of love in reveling in God's love, in enjoying the love of God. Romans 8, 28. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, for them who are called according to his purpose, for whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. More whom, whom he did predestinate, them he also called, and whom he called, them he also justified, whom he justified, them he also glorified. What shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spurred not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died. Ye rather that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are ki killed all the day long. We are accused, accounted to sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. We, we need to meditate on the love of God. You know, something that God loves you today. Think about that. Whatever stresses you're going through today, whatever difficulties you're going through today, God loves you. And his love is immense and it's vast and it's great and it's grand, and it's deep and it's lasting. And that love will not leave you, that love will carry you. And his love is there with you today. And however dark it might be today for you, however difficult it might be for you today, God is with you and he cares about you. And he, and he, and he, and he wants to bring his blessing and his light into your life. So meditate on the love of God. There's a wonderful story of a hero of mine, uh, Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones, wonderful hero of mine, and uh, he was at Westminster Chapel as a preacher, and these, this guy came and he was depressed, really, really depressed, and he, he wondered whether God loved him, whether he was saved or whatever, and well, he 
he came to talk to Lloyd Jones and week after week after week Lloyd Jones sat with him in his vestry and unfolded him Romans chapter 5 and unfolded him the love of God and patiently was gentle and tender in his pastoral care to that person God really really knows what you've been going through he knows what you've gone through he knows your suffering he knows the pain he knows the hurt but he has so much for you today he wants so much blessing so much encouragement for you and he will bring that encouragement and he'll bring that blessing and he'll bring that love to you but it won't come until you meditate on who God is until you meditate on who he is and what he's done for you and all the blessings that he's given you he has given you immense blessings but sad to say that we take our eyes off God and we put our eyes on the problems and on the difficulties and on the situations and when we do that we lose sight of God we shrink God into a little God rather than realize the great God that he is so we've looked at the Christian life is a life of love there and then next the Christian life is a is a life of battle it's a life of battle oh my friends <laughs> don't I know it and how easily it is to fight in the flesh and I have been so guilty uh, as I've been on the internet over the years I have fought in the flesh and oh that's not the real Jason Burns the real Jason Burns is a preacher of the gospel and I've been taught better things than to fight in the flesh I fight in the spirit in the word of God and in the things of God Ephesians chapter 6 verse 10 he says this finally my brethren be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might we gotta be strong in God in the Lord it, it says there my friends Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. There's no be timid, be afraid. No, be strong. We can be strong not in our flesh, not in our wisdom, not in our intellectual ability, not in our apologetic methods or our in apologetic strategies, not in our political activism, not be strong in that, but be strong in in the Lord that's where we have to be strong in the Lord we have to be strong in the Lord and it says put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil that we need the whole armor of God we need the whole equipment of God I have gone when I go into town to do street preaching I go with the whole armor of God when I come on the internet I come on with only part of the armor of God and I get up to get involved I have got involved with these silly internet atheists with the silly conspiracies and all the rest of it but it becomes something of the flesh rather than of the whole armor of God rather than being equipped in God's way with God's equipment he says put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil we are not fighting flesh and blood we are not fighting atheists or whatever we're, we're not fighting anything like that it, 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 it behind the atheists behind the political forces of our time are the wiles of the devil that's who we're fighting we're fighting demonic forces for we wrestle not against flesh and blood but against principalities against powers against the rulers of the darkness of the world against spiritual wickedness in high places the people that we need to be dealing with are the 
demonic forces. We need to be praying for protection for preachers, for protection for the pastor, for protection for each other. We need to be praying that God would vanquish the spiritual dark forces that are around, that are manipulating the political and apologetic and the internet and all the rest of it. These are the dark forces against God and against his people. That is what we are to wrestle against. Wherein take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. He says it again. Take the whole armor of God. He says it twice. Stand therefore having your loins girt about with truth. We need good sound biblical truth. The truth of God is being pushed aside today in the church. People don't want to know what Christian doctrine is but we need the truth. We cannot stand in discussion and debate. We cannot even preach. We cannot even tell a message unless it's based on truth. The truth of the gospel, that Christ is the Son of God and Christ died. Stand there for having your loins girt with truth and having gone the breastplate of righteousness, the righteousness of Christ and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. He's describing a Roman soldier with a shield and with a sword and, and in his armor and regalia and the, the, the arrows will come and he blocks it with a shield. He's got his little sword and he's ready and he's equipped for battle. And he makes, he stands his ground and as he stands his ground, he's then able to repel the enemy. And we need to stand equipped in the armor of God. Above all, take the shield of faith. We've got to have faith. We've got to believe the word of God. We've got to believe God. And above all, take the shield of faith wherein you shall be able to quench the fiery darts of the wicked and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit which the word of God praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit watching thereon with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints we need to be praying in the Spirit if you come on the internet and deal with these people pray in the Spirit we need to be in prayer praying in the Holy Spirit we need to have the helmet of salvation you need to be strong in the truth of, of the gospel you need to be strong in that know why Christ died, know how to defend your faith. And the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, it's the Word of God that has the power, not your logical arguments, not, not anything, but this Word has the power. This is the powerful Word of God. Men may mock it, men may mock it, but I have read Thomas Mann, I have read, I have read Foucault and Immanuel Kant, I have read Bertrand Russell, I have read these cultural elite intellectuals, I've read all these think thinkers and ideas but I've never any, never ever read anything like the Word of God, it's dynamite, it's spiritual dynamite. Let us go in battle with the armor of God, with spiritual armor, with, with spiritual equipment and let us be strong in that. So we've finished our first little study, we'll go on to another one in a second, but the Christian life is one of prayer, it's one of testing, and it's one, a life in the Word of God, and it is a life of love, and it's a life of battle. Those are some of the things of the Christian life today. Be strong, my friend. Be strong in the riches of your God. Be strong in the riches of His grace. Be strong in your God today. Be strong in your God. You believe in a mighty God, a great God, an awesome God, a wonderful God, a majestic God. So be strong in your God today. Do not let the forces of darkness or the enemies of God rob you of your joy, rob you of your relationship with Him. Do not let them rob you of the wonders of God's grace and love to you today. Walk in the blessings that God has given you today. Immerse yourself in the awesome Word of God. 
and won that race. Forgive me for my failures on the internet. I have failed miserably. Forgive me. But be encouraged that we have a we serve a great God, a wonderful God, a great God, a wonderful God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for these great truths today and we thank you that you've provided all good things for us. Oh God, your grace and your mercy and your love is astounding. You're so kind and so great, so majestic, so awesome. Oh God, you are an amazing God. You are a wonderful God. You are a great God. Oh God, we adore you today. And we thank you for your wonderful word. I pray for the dear souls that will hear this Bible study today. The Father, you would wrap them round with your love today. That you would build them up in your truth and you would encourage them. And may they know your love and grace today. Bless them, Father. Fill them, Father, with your Holy Spirit. Bless this Bible study to people's lives. In Jesus' name, Amen. 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 We're going to do another Bible study. I'm going to. I have another one. Uh, so uh, please come and join me if you want to join me. Okay, I'm going to start another Google Hangout now. Okay. <laughs>